About a year ago, like many people around the holidays, I finally bought a 3D printer, and I had no clue what I was signing up for. Not only was the whole thing not quite as plug and play as I was expecting, but since I didn't know a lot of the proper terms for what I was experiencing, Googling solutions proved to be difficult. Over the past year, I ended up slowly fixing most of my issues with good old-fashioned trial and error. So if you're considering buying one, or have found yourself the lucky recipient of a 3D printer, this video contains all the helpful information I wish I knew when I first got mine. Another helpful thing I wish I knew more about? Today's partner, Mint Mobile. But more on that later. The beginning of this journey starts with choosing a printer. I ended up purchasing a Creality Ender 3 S1 Pro, and to be honest, I wish I'd have chose something else. While Creality's printers certainly have an appealing price, and with a lot of tinkering, can produce some amazing prints, if you're just getting started, you're not gonna know how to do all of the fine tuning needed to make it run its best. If I had to buy a first printer today, I would be buying something from Bamboo Labs. If you're on a budget, their A1 Mini, A1, and P1S printers will give you far better results faster prints, and a much better user experience than probably any other consumer printer on the market. While my Ender 3 has been completely reliable so far, the build quality definitely says made in China. The tolerances, fit and finish, and attention to detail of Bamboo Labs printers, at least in my admittedly limited experience, is much, much better. Now, at this point you might be thinking, come on Griffin, what difference is that really going to make? Where I've found tolerances, or a lack thereof, especially begin to show through, is right on the build plate. My plate is not level, and I don't mean out of adjustment. The four knobs built into the plate that allow you to manually level it out are all adjusted as well as they can be, but the plate itself actually has some waves in it. There are things you can do to help mitigate this, like placing pieces of tape or paper underneath the removable magnetic surface of the build plate, but on a printer that I dropped a quartet of Benjamins on, that should not be necessary and in the beginning, it really caused me to struggle. Creality's auto-leveling system really doesn't seem to help either. I feel like it should be pretty simple for the calibration process to create a z-axis lookup table and extrapolate from that what the nozzle height should be to compensate for any little variances in plate height. But either the Creality CR Touch device that it uses to take the height measurements just isn't precise enough, or the software just isn't smart enough to seem to be able to do so. The best way I've found to level my printer so far is to use feeler gauges between the print bed and the nozzle while adjusting the manual leveling knobs and z-axis offset. You can also use a piece of paper if you don't have feeler gauges handy. Once that's done, I print a one-layer sheet of plastic, preferably in a dark material so that defects are easier to see, and I can make further adjustments or place tape under the build plate, based on how that thin sheet turns out. Getting your first layer printed correctly is vital to the success of your prints. Simple prints will turn out remarkably well, even with a misadjusted or unlevel printer. It's only when you start getting into more complex objects that these issues really start cropping up. In my case, part adhesion was the chief among them. I tried seemingly everything, from simply washing the plate all the way to spreading glue over the plate before printing each time. In the end, it took a combination of two things to solve this adhesion problem. First, washing my plate with dish soap ended up leaving a film on the plate that was doing more harm than good. Now, if the plate ever needs washed, rather than washing it with soap and water, I just wipe it down with isopropyl alcohol every few prints, and that's it. Secondly, and even more importantly, is to properly adjust what I call the squish factor. The best way to do this is really by trial and error, but if the bottoms of your prints appear to have lines in them, or you can see gaps between the rows of filament as the first layer is being extruded, your z-axis offset is very likely too high. The nozzle actually needs to press into the filament and spread it out as it's extruded. It squishes it. The tolerances between this being too tight or too loose or properly adjusted is really small, around a quarter to a half of a millimeter in my case, but it makes all the difference in the world. When it's set properly, you should be able to print durable, paper-thin sheets of solid plastic. This ensures the greatest durability between layers, and it really embeds the filament of your first layer into the textured build plate if your printer has one, which should make adhesion a total non-issue. Now that it's set properly, I can barely get prints off off of my build plate, at least until they've cooled. Once a print has finished printing, you can leave it on the build plate until the plate is completely cool 
and then it should lift right off as if someone had just set it down on the plate. Now that our printer is set up and dialed in, let's talk about software. I did some Googling when I first got my printer and the most recommended software seemed to be the Cura program from Ultimaker. But I found this program to be incredibly frustrating. Not only is the interface confusing, but some things that I would expect to be basic features require downloading a plugin. For example, my dad is a staunch aficionado of the Imperial measuring system and has a long career in CAD work behind him, so all the models he's drawn up to print have been in inches instead of millimeters. STL files are unitless and don't differentiate between metric and imperial. It's up to the software to decide which to use and scale the vector model accordingly. Cura does not let you change this and decides that any STL file you open is in metric. I had to rely on a third-party plugin to scale our models to the correct amount of millimeters each time before printing. Furthermore, when you are manipulating a 3D model, it seems to be entirely rendered in software on the CPU of your computer. And on bigger, more complex models, especially after they've been path traced, the whole viewer often slows to a crawl. And my Mac Pro has a 12-core Xeon. I don't even want to think about how this would run on a less powerful machine. This is just two examples, but these little quality of life and ease of use things add up pretty quick to an overall poor user experience. After some more trial and error, I found two softwares that I really liked and that solved pretty much all of my complaints. And those are Bamboo Studio, and a popular fork of Bamboo Studio called Orca Slicer. Both of these programs share a lot of the same code base and they're very similar. They both automatically prompt you to select Imperial or Metric when importing STL files, and they both support GPU accelerated 3D rendering. I found their interfaces to be much easier to navigate and understand than Cura's was, and they both support a dark mode, which my tired eyes often appreciate. You can use pretty much any 3D printer with either of them, but much like how Apple tightly integrates their software software and hardware experiences, Bamboo Studio does integrate better with Bamboo Labs printers, if that's something you value. For me and my Ender 3 though, I can use either pretty much interchangeably and not notice much of a difference. Any other issues you'll have will really depend on your situation. For instance, I still haven't been able to get large ASA prints to complete successfully without warping and cracking, even after building an enclosure and trying to stick a space heater in it to heat it. But with this info and the right printer, you should be able to get some really nice PLA prints. With most materials, I've had great success just using the generic material profiles built into the slicer software I use and adjusting the nozzle and hotbed temperatures to match the filament manufacturer's recommended spec. Another quick note as we wind down here, 3D printing generates a lot of plastic waste. So to cut down on this as much as possible, I would suggest buying your filament on cardboard spools or getting some refillable spools and buying the filament separately, which not only cuts down on waste, but can actually save you some money in the long run. You know what else will help you save some money in the long run? Cutting down on expensive cell phone bills by switching to today's partner, Mint Mobile. Not only will you be served by the United States' largest 5G network, but you can keep the exact same phone number you have now, and plans featuring unlimited talk and text start at just $15 a month. Me and my family have saved quite a bit on our phone bill over the years by using Mint Mobile, and you can too. And to top it all off, switching takes as little as 15 minutes. So head on down to the affiliate link in the description below and sign up today to start saving on cellular. And I think that about does it for today's video, folks. Hopefully, at least some of this will help your 3D printing journey be filled with more fun than frustration. As always, thank you guys so much for watching. If you liked the video, hit like, get subscribed, and ring the bell so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. And I will see you guys in the next one.